Doug, I'll let you pick it up on the fate of America. Thank you, Gary. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you this evening. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Be with us. Bless us. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my job is to teach you a few things, share a few things, hopefully inspire you a little bit, um, and also try to get you out on time. So I'll do my best to do all of those things. Um, we're going to talk tonight about the fate of America. I don't know how many of you had a chance to listen to the Hagman and Hagman show the other night when we had the panel of five on there. All right, so those of you that did not, you will probably want to supplement this presentation with the Hagman and Hagman show from last Wednesday, I believe it was, Wednesday night. There were five of us, John Price, myself, Doug Krieger, Dean McGriff, and uh, Ray Gano. And we went for three hours talking about the subject of the fate of America. Um, I've written uh, about nine books, uh, a number of the last year, just because of the way things worked out. So uh, as Gary mentioned, uh, corporate background, background um, but I have uh, had a great experience writing books and, uh, and researching and uh, have written some in-depth things on history and, uh, and, the, and the, really the history of occultism and spiritualism in America, the history of the Nazi influence upon America post-World War II, and, uh, and quite a few other things. The latest book is called Uncommon Sense uh, that I wrote uh, with my partner Doug Krieger, and uh, we talk a great deal about, well, what we call it a subtitle is a prophetic manifesto for the church in Babylon. So we do believe that the United States is the final Babylon, and consequently, our fate is not necessarily an optimistic one, and it is a fate that we have chosen, uh, not just through the last few years, but really over the last 100 to 150 years. So we will talk about America's fate, what the Bible, we believe, says about America, uh, the fact that we believe America is destined for judgment, um, I will talk to the, t the extent that time allows about some of the threats that we face in America, some of the top threats, and uh, last end up and talk a bit about how do we deal with the challenges of these issues and how do we look forward to and have hope for the days that come. Certainly one of the top questions, uh, I know Bill Saylor says this, one of the top questions that we usually hear asked at conferences like this is, well, what about America? Is America mentioned in the Bible? As you can see from the number of books and presentations that I'm uh, throwing out here on this one slide, it is, in fact, one of the most common questions and one of the most intense questions that we do ask. You know, is the Bible uh, somehow silent about America? Does it talk about us? Uh, and if so, what does it say? Um, so I want to talk a bit about the sort of traditional what I call old school view of America, and, and then I will introduce what, as you will see, many others along with us uh, believe about America and actually have taught for a number of decades. Um, so here I want to share with you a, a three minute I need to tell video. you, I wrote a book called What in the World is Going On? This is David Jeremiah. I devoted Jeremiah. an entire chapter in that book to this question. Does America have a role in biblical prophecy? Do you remember that? And the simple answer is no. But there's more. Indeed, there's no mention of the United States or any other country in North or South America in the Bible. One reason may be that in the grand scheme of history, the United States is kind of like the new kid on the block. As a nation, it is less than 250 years old, much younger than the nations of Bible times that are featured in Bible prophecy. In the chapter that I wrote on does America have a role in prophecy, I set forth three other possible reasons for America's absence in biblical prophecy. Some believe our nation will be incorporated into the European coalition. Others suggest that by the time the tribulation period arrives, America will have been invaded by outside forces and will no longer be a superpower. Perhaps the decay that is so rapidly eating away at our moral foundations will have destroyed us from within. Up until the writing of this particular message, I considered the rapture of the church to be the most probable explanation for the Bible's silence about America's future. My reasoning went something like this. Most of the prophecies of the future have to do with the tribulation period. 
the rapture comes before the tribulation period and here in our country where there are more Christians than any other country in the world when the rapture comes all of the Christians will be taken out immediately if the rapture were to happen today all true believers in Jesus Christ would disappear and America as we know it would be obliterated not only would our country lose 25 percent of her population but she would also lose the very best the salt and light of the nation somebody said it would be like a reverse surgical operation one in which all the healthy cells are removed and the cancerous ones are left to consume one another what if none of the reasons that I postulated in my earlier book have really arrived at the answer as to why America will not be in prophecy what if there's another explanation so obvious that students of prophecy have failed to notice it what if this once great nation because of its inability to repay its trillions of dollars of indebtedness is so weakened as to be absorbed into the new world order and its global economy thus losing its sovereignty and its separate identity could that happen wow I didn't think it could ever even be an item for discussion but now I'm not so sure it's an interesting point of view David really reflects the traditional teaching that really began in earnest with Hal Lindsey's 1969-1970 book The Late Great Planet Earth we think a lot of David Jeremiah He's a wonderful pastor he's written some wonderful books uh, he's a great brother in Christ but on the issue of where does America stand in relationship to Bible prophecy? We believe you couldn't be more wrong. The United States, we believe, is mentioned uh, in very dramatic ways in the end times. And uh, it's my objective tonight to give you uh, some compelling evidence biblically for why we believe that. Uh, this evidence, uh, as you'll see in a moment, is drawn from John Price, who is a friend and advisor to the prophecy forum. But just to uh, kind of hit a couple of key points here, the traditional view is that Rome will be the power base of the Antichrist, that Rome will revive, that there will be ten kings, there will be the little horn, known by many names, over twenty names in the Old Testament, and that this uh, is really drawn from the notion of Daniel 9.27. Uh, Hal Lindsey has stated that uh, you know, he, he sort of was directed to understand that Rome was in fact, the fulfillment of Mystery Babylon, which is a, a view that has been held by uh, Martin Luther, by John Calvin, by John Wesley. It's a very traditional view. Uh, people today, many evangelicals, many Protestants still believe that Rome and the Catholic Church is, uh, is the fulfillment of Mystery Babylon. That view is not entirely incor incorrect, uh, but we happen to believe that Rome fails to qualify for a number of reasons. Oftentimes, we would point out, in fact, we would say specifically, Revelation 16, 19, that one of the key parts of the predictions about Mystery Babylon is missing what is stated by John, that the great city, the great city of Babylon, was divided into three parts. And it discusses those in Revelation 17, 18, 19. And uh, those parts, as we'll talk about, include elements that the Catholic Church, the Vatican, really cannot, uh, in fact, incarnate. The mystery of Mystery Babylon, it is perhaps the greatest mysterion of the New Testament. Um, certainly there's the mystery of in iniquity, there's the mystery of righteousness, there's the mystery of the church and the body of Christ. But the mystery of Mystery Babylon perhaps ranks as the greatest of, of all mysteries. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. We are not the only ones to propose that America is the final Babylon. The late Patrick Heron, the late J.R. Church, the late Rick Coombs, the late Dr. Stanley Monteith, the late Frank Logsdon were men from the prior generation that since the 1960s and 1970s speculated that America may in fact be the fulfillment based upon the detailed prophecies uh, particularly in the Old Testament which we'll talk about today Noah Hutchings a good brother Southwest Radio Church Tom Horn I'm sure most of you are familiar with Tom John Price a colleague who I'll share more about uh, Rob Skiba Douglas Krieger Dean McGriff my co-authors obviously yours truly uh, I don't know if you want to call us the dirty dozen 
but uh, there are at least a dozen of us that have written a number of books that talk about why we believe America is, the USA is, the fulfillment of Mystery Babylon. If I turn first to, to non-biblical sources, to, ex, to occult sources, such as Manly P. Hall, um, we are probably familiar with the fact that the Masonic conspiracy theory proposes that America was formed indeed for the purpose of creating this final great nation in which reason and not religion would reign. Franklin spoke of the order of the quest, and I'm quoting Manley P. Hall here, and most of the men who worked with him in the early days of the American Revolution were also members. The plan was working out. The new Atlantis, which is Francis Bacon's uh, title, was coming into being in accordance with the program laid down by Francis Bacon 150 years earlier. The rise of the American democracy was necessary to a world program, also sometimes called in masonry the great work. Those mystical extrasensory perceptions viewed with suspicion by the materialist would then be developed according to the disciplines of the sciences and all learning would be consecrated to the supreme end that men become as the gods knowing good and evil. I would uh, submit to you for your consideration that that is a very explicit statement regarding the uh, program for Lucifer that was first promised to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Well, what does the Bible say about America? The study really needs to be on what we call the daughter of Babylon. I will re uh, reference in this presentation, I've done other presentations uh, that you can see me talking about on YouTube and so forth. I've done a couple of programs on the subject with Gary Stearman uh, at Prophecy in the News, which you can find on the internet. But I'm referring here to John Price's work, The End of America. I don't agree with John in terms of his interpretation of who the Antichrist probably is uh, and the final uh, sort of power base of the Antichrist in the world. But we do agree with John in terms of his interpretation of America as the fulfillment of the daughter of Babylon. Um, Psalm 137, Isaiah 13, 47 and 48, Jeremiah 50 and 51, Zechariah 2, 7, Revelation 17 and 18. There are 20, 223 verses that talk about the daughter of Babylon, mystery Babylon, and we believe, as you'll see here, that, uh, that the evidence is very substantial and scriptural that America is the fulfillment of the prophecies. Just read a couple of the prophecies on the daughter of Babylon, Psalm 137. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. And that, of course, is, is referred to again or referenced in Revelation about the whore of Babylon. And uh, in other presentations, we talk about the princess of Tyre, uh, the, the princess of Canaan, Jezebel, and so on. Again, all pictures of the daughter of Babylon. So I'm going to select 12 attributes of this end times rich nation. Uh, John Price talks about 30 attributes. Rick Coombs on his website has 70 reasons why America is the fulfillment of the daughter of Babylon. So this is not, this is not just idle speculation. It is exposition that has been being done for at least the last five decades and has been done some, by some very great Bible scholars. Could it be, as I read through these, I want you to be thinking, could these uh, prophecies be fulfilled by the European Union? Could they be fulfilled by Israel? Could Israel be the daughter of Babylon? Could it be Saudi Arabia or Turkey? Many are proposing, many, many YouTube videos out there talking about that. Will it be ancient Babylon rebuilt? Many have speculated that that's the case. Or, as we go through these prophecies, will you agree with me that only the United States of America fits the bill, that it meets the criteria? And certainly, uh, as you read again later on your own, the chapters of Jeremiah 50 and 51, I would encourage you to think about it, meditate carefully as you look at and reread these prophecies. This rich time nation, in one hour, Revelation says, 
In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. The first is the question, are the mother and the daughter one and the same? Jeremiah 50, 12 says, Your mother shall be greatly ashamed. She who gave you, uh, gave you birth shall be humiliated. There are 99 verses in these chapters. As you read them, a few of them will seem to appear uh, by reference to relate just to the old Babylon. But most of the verses cannot be fulfilled by Babylon. Babylon doesn't really have a mother, but the United States does have a mother. Good old mother country, England. And it's true to say that the mother has been confounded by our behaviors from time to time. The second reason is Jeremiah calls this rich nation the hammer of the whole earth. But he predicts, he says, how is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? How is Babylon become a desolation among the nations? It's important to note that the U.S. spends 49% of all the military expenditures in the world, we spend half of that money. Depending upon your source, anywhere from 800 to 1,000 military bases exist that are manned and financed by the United States. The number on Russia's bases outside the United States is less than a handful, and China has, I believe, one. Who else polices the world besides the United States? The United States simply is the greatest military empire ever assembled. We have uh, 20 carrier groups. Uh, the, the, as you'll see in this chart, all of the U.S. carriers are surrounded by a, a red box. All of the other carriers, the puny carriers of all of the other countries of the world are excluded outside that box. As Revelation 13, 4 says, and they worshiped the dragon who gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Number three, it's a latter-day nation. Jeremiah says, Behold, the hindermost of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. And it is the Hebrew word which I'll probably butcher, akareth, which means end or latter or last of a kind. But it never means, although it's translated by the New International Version as least, it never means least in the Old Testament. So why the NIV translated it as least is a real question. But it is a latter-day nation. It is, in fact, the greatest of the latter-day nations. And for all intents and purposes, the United States is a very young country at a little more than 200 years old. It's a nation of wealth and luxury. Because ye have all grown fat as the heifer at grass. A sword is upon her treasures. You are who are rich in treasures. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, of course, garments of the rich, and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. John says, or the angel says to John, give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and they shared in her luxury, so clearly it is a, a great rich nation. I don't have time to talk much about this, but um, the, the land of Canaan, north of Dan, north of the um, Mount Hermon, was the land of Canaan, and Canaan means merchant. Uh, Canaan, the Phoenicians, also known as the Phoenicians, settled um, Carthage in North Africa, and then across the, the Straits of Gibraltar, it settled Tartishos. Does anyone, that which is in Spain, does anyone remember where Jonah, when he was deciding that he wanted to go somewhere else other than Nineveh, where he wanted to go? To Tarshish, to Tartishos. Why? Because it was to the extreme west, and Nineveh, he was going to have to go to the northeast. So he was trying to go in the opposite direction. In the Old Testament, Tarshish is, is the commercial empire. You can see all the references, and as you look those up, what you'll see is it's always considered the most wealthy of nations at that time. Love to talk about how this nation and this, these incredible empire might have been, in fact, active in the Americas 2,000 years before Christ. There's a lot of geography or archaeology now that is suggesting that that, in fact, is the case. I'm showing the Spanish real, the coin, but above that, 
These are sometimes known as the pillars of Hercules, and you see the caduceus uh, between them, the little S shape. Does anyone realize that that is a symbol of the United States currency? That was the, that was the motto and also the symbol for Ferdinand and Isabella. And they, and they obviously sent Columbus off to discover which nation? America. And in fact, the dollar symbol is the sign of the currency of the Spanish Empire that founded the uh, American colony, certainly in the southern part of the United States. This is interesting. Think about, could it be that Israel, could it be that Turkey or Saudi Arabia or even Europe fulfills this prophecy? Jeremiah 50, 37, a sword is upon the mingled people that are in the midst of her. Jean Hector de uh, St. Jean de Croix de Cour, I think I did that right, talks about you know, over 200 years ago the nature of the American people. It was indeed a mingled people. You don't see that in Turkey or in Israel. You see that in the United States of America. This is a nation that lives on many waters, Jeremiah 51, 13. You who live by many waters and are rich in treasures, your end has come, the time for you to be cut off. Think about the fact that we are on three oceans. While we have 2% of the land mass of the world, 20% of the fresh water uh, exists in the Great Lakes alone in the world. 22 states have 400 ports, major ports of New York City, Los Angeles, Seattle, Houston. Woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. The waters you saw where the prostitute Babylon the great sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The center of world commerce, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? I find this chart particularly interesting. Since 1970, when Hal Lindsey suggested that Europe would become the new uh, power center of the Western nations of the West, Europe, even the, uh, the European Union, has continued to decline as a percentage of the world GDP. But look at the United States, the blue line. It's essentially stayed the same, somewhere between about 26 and 28 percent. Yes, Asia is growing, but still, the United States right now, as we enter into uh, 2014, 2015, uh, is still the, the world's largest commercial power. Despite the fact that we've gone through in 2008 and 2009 the greatest Ponzi scheme ever, $20 trillion was lost worldwide, but no one went to jail. Who does that tell you really runs the United States now? It's not the Congress, not even the President. It's Wall Street. I could go and talk more about this, which I don't have time to, but it is a, it is a shocking account. If you haven't seen the documentary Inside Job, narrated by Matt Damon, I highly recommend it. It will explain to you these very strange uh, credit default swaps and derivatives and all that and why it was in fact the greatest of criminal activities and, uh, and the bankers were all paid back gambling with our money, they lost our money and then we paid them back again. And now it's even larger, it's even a bigger case of companies that are too big to fail than it was before. She mounts up to the heavens. Think about this, predicted over 2,500 years ago. Though Babylon should mount up to the heaven, and though she should fortify the height of her strength, yet from me spoilers come unto her, saith the Lord. We had a man on the moon. We have interplanetary space exploration now, uh, as you know, as you see it out to Jupiter, to Saturn, and beyond. We have the Star Wars, Star Wars missile defense system. And as Gans Shimura, our colleague, will talk about tomorrow morning, uh, perhaps there's even a secret space program. There are other surprises, no doubt, that exist. We only sort of unfurled the F-117 Nighthawk when Ronald Reagan decided to bomb Gaddafi uh, over the Pan Am jet, the Lockerbie jet that was destroyed. Chances are good there are other things, perhaps a triangular-shaped UFO that the United States has already tested and has certain features that, if it's needed, 
could be brought to bear. Reason number nine, where the nations gather. This is very unique to the United States. And the nations shall not flow together any more unto him, and the nations will no longer stream to her. You said, I will continue forever, the eternal queen. But you did not consider these things that reflect on what might happen. So sit in silence, go into darkness, daughter of the Babylonians. No more will you be called the queen of kingdoms. The United States has a large Jewish population. And since there are 10 examples or 10 statements in the Old and New Testament about the people of God fleeing from Babylon, there must be Jews and presumably Christians living in that nation. Jeremiah 50, in those days at that time declares the Lord, the people of Israel and the people of Judah together will go in tears to seek the Lord their God. They will ask the way to Zion and turn their faces toward it. Flee out of Babylon. Leave the land of the Babylonians. The global world uh, Jewish population, this is from, I believe, 2012, the American Jewish yearbook. And notice in this uh, tally that the United States still has slightly more Jews than does Israel. But notice the rest of the world is less than about 15% of the remaining Jewish population. Turkey doesn't have a large Jewish population, nor does Saudi Arabia, quite obviously. Iran has a reasonable one because many of the Jews never came back after they went there back in 586 B.C. One of the most damning, number 11, she deserted, deserted Yahweh and Jesus. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. The old Babylon was never a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. It has always served as the city that opposed the kingdom of God. Think about 50 years ago, 80% of all the mission monies in the world came from the U.S. Today, it's the world leader in entertainment and exports, uh, entertainment exports, uh, both soft porn and hardcore pornography. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a bad cold. It has been the standard setter, killing over 57 million children through abortion and being the standard setter for abortion rights throughout the world. We have taught the rest of the world our ways. Now we appear to be establishing same-sex marriage as a constitutional right. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. As I've said many times before, the history of the United States, it's not that we did not have pilgrims and Puritans that settled in Massachusetts. It's not that we didn't have phenomenal, great men and women of God in this country. We certainly did. But at the same time, we also settled in Jamestown um, individuals, a colony that was financed by Francis Bacon and by the Freemasons. <coughs> and so, as I say, the wheat and the tares have grown together. Almost 400 years later, the tares have been overtaking the wheat. Madame Blavatsky, who was the founder of Theosophy, and really from America, from New York City, no surprise, was crucial to the creation of the New Age movement. She was writing The Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled in the, in the late 19th century, and it was her doctrine that was as influential as any in the formation of the National Socialist and their occult beliefs and creeds in Germany that led to World War II. Perhaps the most important of all is Israel is ultimately betrayed by her. Before your eyes I will repay Babylon and all who live in Babylonia for all the wrong they have done in Zion. In Jeremiah it says, May the violence done to our flesh be upon Babylon, say the inhabitants of Zion, <coughs> May our blood be on those who live in Babylonia, says Jerusalem. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. See, I will defend your cause and avenge you. Has America betrayed Israel? Think about these books. Bill Koenig's book, Eye to Eye. Uh, John McTiernan's book, America, As America Has Done to Israel. Uh, David Brennan, a good friend and brother. 
has written a number of books, two called The Israel Omen, one and two. And of course, most famous of all uh, has been the book by Jonathan Kahn, The Harbinger, discussing the fact that 911 was likely talked about in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10 and 11, <coughs> that the United States was likely attacked in part because of its betrayal of Israel and the uh, insistence that the American government had upon the uh, prime ministers of Israel that they sacrifice the small amount of land they had for peace. That great city is fallen, is fallen. It's interesting that that is uh, a phrase that we've heard, we're familiar with in Revelation, but it's also repeated in Isaiah. That's why I always say that to really understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand Old Testament prophecy because so much of it is referenced in, in, uh, in, in the Revelation. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. How quick will it happen? Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her take balm for her pain, if so she be, or be she, may be healed. In other words, the Lord would still, heal, still be willing to heal Babylon, but she would not be healed. I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to have to go quickly, but I want to talk about the greatest threats and kind of give you a threat assessment as to what might happen to the United States. Five threats. The economy collapses is certainly the one we hear a great deal about, despite the fact that we are predicting that, that the United States will fall. It is not as obvious, not as apparent as many would argue, that it's because of certain economic factors, such as the fact that we have sold such a, a massive amount of debt to foreign, uh, foreign countries, which is true. Uh, but in this case, this first slide really deals with just the, the size of the debt in relationship to our gross domestic product. Now that's a kind of a fancy way of just saying how much debt, for instance, in your personal family, how much debt can you manage based upon your income? It's essentially the same on our country's basis. And it's not as alarming as one might think. Over 10 years, we've grown uh, about 50% the amount of debt in relationship to our income. Foreign debt, <clears throat> about half of our debt is owned by foreigners. Roughly half of that is owned by China and Japan, which I think is interesting. But it's not necessarily the fact that we have sold off a lot of our debt, our T-bills our and so forth, to foreign governments. I don't even believe that necessarily that the dollar by itself, no longer being the reserve currency, is in fact as big a threat as many have said. However, uh, you know, the, one of the reasons I would say that uh, is because as a reserve currency, the United States still is about two-thirds of the reserve currency, the diverse sort of portfolios that uh, many nations have. They still hold about, on average, 60% of their, in effect, their assets in dollars. So I don't necessarily believe that the greatest threat is the economy or an economic collapse. There are many that say that. I think they're probably wrong. Will it happen eventually? Yes, but as I'll say in a moment, for a different reason. What about EMPs, electromagnetic pulses? Don't have time to explain, but I bet most of you are familiar with the idea that when an atomic bomb goes off, it creates what's called an EMP, and it can knock out electrical devices of every kind for a wide, wide range. So a single uh, missile detonated above, let's say, Kansas City, Missouri, could actually knock out all the electrical systems throughout the United States. So it doesn't necessarily take a large or many nuclear bombs to paralyze the United States. This is also known as asymmetric warfare. It's what a nation, a poor nation, might do to, to hurt us but we would not necessarily be in a position to do to them because they don't necessarily have the kind of electrical-based economy that we have. This is what's very scary. Michael Moloff, who is a reporter and consultant to WND, WorldNet Daily, this is the great, one of the great threats, that in one year, based upon the destruction of the electric grid, perhaps as many as 90% of Americans 
will be killed or will die as a result of the failure of water systems, sewage systems, riots, and so forth. So it is a horrific issue, and, and as some say, uh, it is, let's see if I said that there. No, but it can be as great a, a threat, in fact, I should say it this way, it's a greater threat now as we get more advanced in our technologies, rely more upon computers, becomes a greater threat now than it has been at any other time before. Is Ebola the, the great threat? Uh, it's, you know, we talk about the fourth horse of the apocalypse. The, you know, Ebola was originated in 1976 in the Congo. Is it coming? Is it coming fast? Is it really going to happen? Um, we, we know that it's, uh, it's cer certainly still raging in certain countries in, uh, in Africa. Uh, we have a brother from Nigeria. Nigeria successfully ended uh, the Ebola outbreak not that long ago, which is, uh, which is phenomenal, I think. But my point is that while it is certainly possible that Ebola could be a huge threat to our country, it's not necessarily proven yet, and it just simply requires watching carefully. So I'm not as panic-stricken as, let's say, some that are talking about Ebola as a, uh, as a threat. True, it's very possible, uh, as a number of friends and colleagues have talked about, that Ebola may have already been turned into a weapon. That is a possibility. Uh, not just chemical warfare, but bio-warfare is, is, in fact, uh, part of our arsenal and part of our dealing with the threats of foreign nations. Now, I think one of the greater threats really is a computer virus, more so than the Ebola virus. Computer virus can be extremely destructive and essentially as destructive as the EMP. This one is more difficult because it can happen. We had just recently um, attacks uh, on Wall Street um, and the J.P. Morgan Company, what, by what is believed, were Russians. Uh, they were just testing. They were poking around in the computers. They weren't necessarily going to do destruction, but they left some fingerprints to let us know that they could. Why might they be doing that right now? Because we're poking Putin in the eye, right? This is how the U U.S. economy could collapse. There's a lot of analysis that's out there. Uh, this is showing that it's very, very few cases of true cyber espionage, but despite that, it may only take a single virus planted that is very, very powerful, sort of like the Stuxnet virus that uh, disabled the Iranian nuclear reactors for the better part of a year, year and a half. Uh, it could happen. I didn't talk about the SCADA systems in America, but those are the controlling systems of computers that control our oil and natural gas. Think about it if our oil and natural gas is disrupted and we can't get the, the oil and we can't get that through our pipelines to where it needs to be. Last, suitcase nukes. This is perhaps one of the scariest of all of the threats. Suitcase nukes have been talked about for a long time. This is the epitome of asymmetric warfare. Muslim terrorists are talked about as the usual suspects. This has been studied by a number of committees in Congress over the past 10 years. Almost nothing has been done to address the issues. You have in addition to potential terrorists that have picked up uh, one of the perhaps 60 or 70 missing suitcase nukes that supposedly existed and were created by the Soviet Union, um, those may have fallen into the hands of Muslim terrorists. But in addition to that, you have, I don't have a slide here, but you have a number of, uh, of nations that have submarines that could launch a single missile or a few missiles into key ports. Does anyone know what nation has the most submarines on Earth right now? They're not nuclear. You might be surprised. North Korea. North Korea has more submarines deployed, traditional attack subs, than any other nation, including the United States. North Korea is a serious threat. What could be the top targets? The ports, the cities that are associated with sex, pornography, uh, those issues that the fundamentalist Muslims would speak against, as we should. The question then is, well, what, you know, is the threat? What could, 
what could be a preventative measure. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a, co a, a congressional committee that researched this. I have about five slides left. The commission believes that unless the world community acts decisively and with great urgency, it is more likely than not that a weapon of mass destruction will be used in a terrorist attack somewhere in the world by the end of 2013. In our judgment, America's margin of safety is shrinking, not growing. This was from 2008. And this was truly stunning when I did the research on this because I went to bed, went to sleep at night a few weeks ago and was trying to, actually trying to go to sleep, was having a hard time going to sleep and I was thinking what could be a possible deterrent to this kind of threat? Well, I thought, well, perhaps we'd threaten to nuke uh, Medina and Mecca. Surely no one's ever thought of that. Au contraire. It's been talked about a lot for years that this, in fact, should be the reaction and, in fact, may have already been the reaction. It may have even been, it's been rumored that uh, George Bush essentially let um, Osama bin Laden know that if anything happened, another 911 happened in America, that the United States would not hesitate to do its very best to destroy the Muslim religion. And am I suggesting that that's a step that we should take? Of course not. But it's possible that that issue is in play. And I point that out because that's how serious these issues are, that these kinds of measures are being, t are being thought about and contemplated and perhaps even planned at this time. So is it too late for America? Grant Jeffrey, the late Grant Jeffrey, talked about one nation under attack. Joel Rosenberg, perhaps the most, uh, the most popular prophecy teacher and, and speaker, has written about that. Uh, John Price, uh, our book, The Final Babylon, we talk about that. Um, what might be the case? Well, uh, Teddy Roosevelt talked about perhaps we should talk softly and carry a big stick. You know, is that the way that we face, face these future threats? I think it's interesting what was said uh, in Judges. I'm not sure if this was Joshua or Caleb that said this, but said, he said mockingly to, um, to the Jews, go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. You know, the Antichrist is known as the god of forces, the god of fortresses. And um, it's a god, he is a person who relies upon the military. You know, does the U.S. president rely heavily upon the military to enforce its policy? Certainly. Absolutely. All right. But I would propose that in the final analysis, as Christians, we cannot necessarily prevent. That does not mean we should not be praying, that we should not be hoping for revival. But as time moves on, it looks less and less likely that that hope is going to have a chance to come to pass. And so I would encourage you strongly to meditate upon the Scripture. Build up your hope and your confidence in scripture such as Psalm 121, which means so much to me. I look up toward the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. I'd also like to share real quickly a verse that you're familiar with from 2 Peter 2.9, and I'm going to refer to it on my phone because I knew that getting my computer to respond rapidly would probably not be easy given the technology that, uh, that we're challenged with. But 2 Peter 2, 9, a verse that you're familiar with. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. As we move forward into these last of the last days, our reliance upon God as our Savior is going to become more and more critical. So I encourage you to strengthen yourself both with the community of believers like this that will help reinforce your confidence, to look forward to that high calling, the glorification of the believer that is the promise and the commitment to us, to have confidence, the fact that God does love us, and many of us he will deliver. Now, does that mean that the rapture won't happen? Am I saying that? No, I still tend to be, believe in a rapture occurring sometime well before the physical second coming of Christ. But I don't believe that the rapture will decimate America. Uh, Jeremiah, David Jeremiah suggests that perhaps 25% of the Americans will be raptured. That seems a rather optimistic belief 
in the number of, of Christians that are in America. And uh, I also still believe that uh, God is able to rapture without uh, the believers without a single plane falling from the sky, uh, a single car being unmanned, uh, a single person necessarily dying from someone that was raptured out of their operating heavy machinery, let's say. So uh, that is the God whom we serve. If I had more time, I'd play you a little song that I had queued up, but I'm out of time. It's past 10 o'clock. We have to actually move rather rapidly uh, to, uh, to leave the, the, the building. So we'll begin tomorrow. I'll talk more tomorrow in a talk about specifically about the motivation uh, that we have uh, in a program I'll do called The Betrayal of the Kingdom of God. So thank you all very much. God bless. Thank you, Doug. Great presentation, as always. You're the best. I aspire to be like you when, I'm, <laughs> when I become a real Bible scholar. Yeah, well, tomorrow you and I will.